welcome we've just been chatting rubbish so i've got that out of the way before you got here katie you've missed dave being inappropriate you're lucky um we haven't put a title in for this week um i think each i think i said this last week each week we do try and come up with something but one of the things that i know i've had lots of conversations with people about over the last particularly in the last three months is the unknown and kind of living with uncertainty and that kind of thing so i think we'll probably speak a bit about that tonight um but we'd love it if people do have questions they can either um just ask them or they can type it in the chat um because we want it to be relevant to who's on the call um what i think i've probably told this story before but when i was going through my separation from my husband and i didn't know where i was going to live i didn't know how my um work was going to be affected i was filming a business training so people going into the bus into business sharing the three principles and i was filming it and they often do exercises with people and they said would i mind being um the person that kind of was showing other people how to do the exercise so they got me and then the two of them to demonstrate and it was i was person a and person a in this group had to talk about something that was on their mind and so what came out of my mouth is i'm living in the unknown i don't know where i'm living i don't know about my job i don't know about my relationships i'm in this huge unknown and i feel kind of at sea and i didn't really know what else i could say so i, I had less than i did less than a minute and then the two of them sat and discussed what they'd heard me talk about and the example that they gave was it, it's as if you've overheard a conversation with someone in a supermarket so i could have been telling my friend and you've overheard that and then they had to sort of like go off as if i couldn't hear them and speak about my problem as if they were just sort of chatting about it like isn't it interesting what we heard that woman talking about in the supermarket they didn't want to fix it they didn't want to give advice it was just more of a, like an intrigue and i think it was i i think it was robin um robin charbit who one of the first things he said was oh isn't it interesting that she thinks she's more in the unknown now than she normally is and it was almost like a light bulb moment for me because in my head because it seemed that physical things in my world were up in the air that I was living in an unknown. But then I saw how, well, I'd created the idea that those things meant I was living in a known. But actually, if you'd asked me three months before, would I be in the position I was in? I would have just said, no way, that would never happen. So my, even what I thought was the known was made up. And I think you start to see that what it is that we live in is an imagination. We live in an imagination of a known, an imagination of how a future is gonna play out we imagine what it is that creates our security and well-being, and there it's always linked to external things and i think that example for me really brought me back down to where does security and well-being actually lie like where is my where is my okayness how do i keep my bearings even though things in the in the world can be completely um, changeable and I think throughout that time, that was one of the most helpful things I could have heard because suddenly I, I found I had my bearings again, that I had put my well-being and my worth in a life that I've created, created with someone. And I'd forgotten that the principles is pointing us back within to where actual freedom, security, well-being, peace of mind, happiness exists. And that exists regardless of circumstance. And I thought it was such a funny thing because I know I've talked to people all around the world in all different um, settings about it's not the circumstance that creates your experience, that your wholeness and your well-being exists within you regardless of that stuff. And it was almost like, wow, what have I been, what, how have I not seen that in my own life? How have I not seen that I've placed so much of my happiness on an external world, being a particular way? And it was another thing at that time where quite, um, is he chewing something? Rusty's chewing something on the floor. He's got, he's got a peach stole. 
Get, get it up here. Yeah. I'm um, going to get bitten now. Just excuse the noise one second. Is he could choke him. We've already had him in the vet today. He's hurt his hip. Sorry, Rust. Sorry, Rust. Um. <laughs> <laughs> They're all there. <laughs> then another part of that was how quite um, visibly on Facebook there was comments about me and my life and my life choices and there was a lot of judgment from people who I thought were friends, people I'd never met, people that had been on my courses before. And for someone who's kind of spent a huge amount of their life trying to be invisible, not stand out from the crowd, not be noticed, it was suddenly like, it felt like I was in the limelight. And the Three Principles community really is quite a small community, community compared to some others. But for me, it was thousands of people who kind of knew me and my ex-husband Rudy as a couple. And then suddenly there was like public discussion and about my, my personal life. And it was another one of those moments where I, I really got to learn the power of what Sid pointed to because I realized, oh, I'm still okay. People are judging me. People are outwardly saying horrible things about me. These things that I'd feared and I'm still all right. And I think the lovely thing about that time was that so many of us try and avoid difficult times or avoid feelings that we don't like and I learned how much learning there is in all experience in all feelings and that so so much of what I'd tried to avoid in life like being seen being judged it didn't then have the impact hang on a minute I'll just there we go didn't have the impact and I think I believed in the power and the truth behind the principles when I heard it first shared in 2005 with Dr. Roger Mills sitting in a room in London. And I would have said wholeheartedly, I knew that what was being pointed to was true. But I didn't realize that then over the course of the next 15 years, like I'd be brought to my knees and humbled by the power of my own mind to create awful realities. But then how much insight and wisdom can come from that. And you see that we we spend so much of our life trying to avoid certain feelings and thinking that feelings and experiences are who we are. But the, it feels like the, the, the power and the truth of something so simple keeps bringing you back to, and I'm still okay. And I'm still okay. And I'm still okay. <laughs> and I didn't realize that I could have that insight again and again and again. Because I know when you asked me what was there at the beginning when you first woke up to the principles and it was, there's nothing ever to worry about. That was number one. And the other one was I'm not broken and I do not need fixing. And I didn't realize how many times I'd get to see that but at a deeper level and see the truth of it again because I would have said if nothing had changed after that first insight, I would have been all right. Because suddenly I just had a bit more peace and ease in my life. But then I look back now and think about how much ease and peace I experience now. It's like, wow, I, it's like scratching the surface. And then it's like, I'm still scratching the surface because I know that there is, we've got a friend who, when he shares his understanding of life, he gets to the point where he just goes, because he knows it's not in the words. And I think it's so easy to get lost in the words. And, and But I know that there's, there's a message that gets convey, co conveyed and has been conveyed throughout time that's trying to point people and wake people up to the nature of themselves, what they are. And I think that's within religions, it's within philosophy. And I feel like we got to be alive in a time where Sydney Banks, saw something so simply and it was like it was in our language and I, I do feel we got to be alive in a time where a, a man had a serious insight that's rip, its ripple effects from that one man are phenomenal 
the amount of people that have been impacted because of the what because of he, his insight is incredible and there isn't he knew that his message his insight would die with him because he could only try and convey a message to people within words to then share but he also saw that that was enough because people that were working alongside him started seeing change in their practice in their clients psychologists psychiatrists he started seeing change on the island so it's like we can sometimes think our insights are small or insignificant or we want a deeper understanding but i think i would say to people have an awareness of what one small insight can do if you times that over the rest of your life so for me just knowing i wasn't broken i didn't realize the impact that was going to have on me or the power of it and how many times i could see it again and again and i think like we've spoken to a couple of people on this call about their ideas of what it's going to look like when they see this and it's like wanting this huge light bulb moment or bells and whistles but so often it's more subtle and it's more every day and it is that more ease in just being who you are for me finding my voice and being able to say how i feel <laughs> like it can seem like a simple thing that for you you've always found it very easy to say how you feel and, and speak up so it's like for you that wouldn't be an insight that you'd have but for me it's like oh you can speak so you can see that it's it, it's whatever is is relevant for us we start to see and have insight around so it's like this this one truth and there's this principles that we're continually trying to point people towards but then what manifests in our life is personal to us <clears throat> and there's a lot it's perfect for us yeah and there's, there's a simple logic to that the, when you start to look at this there is a simple logic to that point it's like how can one how can one message have such impact on so many different people. How can one message, so for example, some people come along and addiction's a problem and they, they get to hear this message and they suddenly wake up and realize I'm not an addict. Um, somebody who's depressed some can suddenly go, well, I'm not depressed now, anxious, angry, whatever it is, you know, and uh, it's like when you start to look at this, there is a really simple logic to it why is it that this this one conversation can have such impact in so many different ways and it's because it's talking before ego i'm not saying these words that we're speaking now i'm not talking about that i'm talking about what these words are actually ultimately talking about it's it's talking before ego <clears throat> ego you know you you tell somebody you mention to somebody the word ego, it, it kind of uh, grates a bit. We don't like it. Uh, you got a big ego. What? <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those things which we, it can really, really, really kind of feel the kind of, don't say that. But we all have ego. And ego shows up in so many different ways. How can we, how do we know ego shows up in so many different ways? Well, look at everybody. Everybody on earth is totally different. We're all different. It's that simple. That simple. We're all different. But we're all united. And we're all united by something that creates the ego. It's something that creates my ego. It's something that creates Jen's ego, the ego of Jen, the ego of Dave, because Ali and Alan and Mark and Colette and all these and Katie and Susan and Leanne and um, Ema and Angie and Colin and his beautiful wife, who I can't see actually because you're hidden behind a photograph. But here we all are. We're all different. We all have our different likes and our own our own likes and dislikes we all have our own preferences we all find different people attractive we all like different music you know we, we all have our different rights and wrongs 
we'll have our different goods and bads. We'll have our different morals. We all have our different cultural beliefs. Interests. You know, you really look at a human being, you realise they're not a singular thing. The ego isn't a singular thing. It's a, it's a plethora. It's a, it's a belief system. Beliefs come and go. Thoughts come and go. Minds change. So the ego isn't a static thing. If you really look at it, it's not a static thing. It's an ever-changing. You could call it an evolutionary thing. It's, a, it's an ever-changing thing as an ego. What I liked when I was, I remember being three years old and stood outside my back door with my friend Matthew and I had this blue t-shirt that said OK on it. And as far as I was concerned, it was a number and I was a runner in a marathon. And it was like, I believed it. Oh, that was who I was. And now I'm a really good runner because I've got this t-shirt on. It's like, that was a belief that I held in that moment. I was proper cute, by the way. I was so cute. I remember I ran around my grand's house and came back and I remember saying, I'm a proper runner now. And now I look at myself and I go, nah, I won't really call myself a proper runner. I can run if I have to. But You're being chased. if I'm being chased by something like a lion or something like that, I could probably run the probably actually just give up and get eaten at some point. But it's like my, my belief at that time was I was a good runner at three years old. Now, yeah, I can get by. And it's like, but the adamance of the three-year-old, the adamance that I was good was, you know, it, it's come and gone. It's changed. My likes as a five-year-old are very different to my likes now. My likes as a 40-year-old are very different to my likes as a 30-year-old. When I was a 30-year-old, I used to go out and get battered. Every night, just, I was getting hammered. I liked alcohol and now, I'm, now I don't do that. You know, and it, it's, it's such an interesting thing when you start to look at the ego. You can never put your finger on it. Because the moment you put your finger on it, it's a thought. It's form. It's a really, really tricky, tricky thing is the ego. But when Sid came with his message, it was like, it suddenly simplified everything. And this is the beauty of, I feel like Sid's message, it was just dead simple. And it was, everything is thought. Even the idea of who you think you are, it's all thought. We're back to this unknown. Like you mentioned at the beginning, you, you perhaps you wanted to talk about the unknown tonight. Thought. This unknowable force. It's knowable insofar as here we sit as thinkers. But to truly understand what it is, what it's capable of, the magnitude of it, its infinite possibilities, it's impossible to know. The mind cannot get its head around infinity. And if you really look at thought, you realise it is infinity. Thought is infinity. It's a never-ending thing. It has no end. You can never get to the end of thought. It's a now thing. And here we sit as thinkers, as dreamers. Thinking we know something about ourselves and this world and life. And I remember Sid saying about the ego, he said, the ego is just everything you believe to be true about yourself and this world. This is the thing that people dedicate their lives to seeing past in Buddhism and Hinduism. They say, if you want to find peace, you must see past the ego. So people dedicate their lives to trying to see past the ego. I think other words, people sometimes use it, identity, um, personality, character, mm. like any of those words could be, could replace the word ego. Yeah. So if you don't like it, 
like pick another one yeah or if you see it in a different way but you can see that all of those words are describing what we take on rather than what we're born as mm. ego is i And I remember when I, I had an experience not so long ago, when I got to see very clearly a moment of clarity, which comes every now and again when I'm lucky. And I just got to see that the memory, when I am not in memories, there is no identity of self. There is no story of me. There is no ego. And you see that the ego is literally a, it's everything we've already thought, everything we've done, everything we remember. It's ideas we carry around with us, things we've thought before. So you see that in, in ego, it's always a retrospective thing, is ego. It's always a looking backwards thing. We're always looking back into the past to tell people who we are now. Who are you? Well, name's Dave. I remember that. That's my name. I remember my name. I remember it from when I was given it at the age of God knows what. I think I was just been born. I was nearly called James. Some people say I suit James better than Dave. What else are you, Dave? Well, I'm, a, I'm an ex-tree surgeon. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hated it, but I loved it. Tell all these stories about it. Oh, God. These people, that person. Oh, I'm just... You know, I was an angry man. I spent a lot of time in my life being angry. I still get angry sometimes. I'm always looking back. I'm always telling people about the past. As though that makes me who I am now. Now now as in this moment does that truly make me who i am now truly or are they moments gone by are they now just a ball of memories memories that i idly regurgitate to people and tell people that's who i am It's a nice thing when we allow ourselves to stop identifying with all those things. There's such a freedom comes when we realize we're not that. We're not that. No, that, that's, that's something that doesn't actually exist now. Those are memories. The memory exists now. It can only ever be experienced in the now kind of memory. It's the only time the place, the only place the past actually exists is in, in, in thought now, a memory. But it's nice when we start to recognize that's not who we are. That's not what life is. What is it to be alive? I think you pointed out to me that in, in so many ways, it's total innocent self obsession. Like I hadn't realized when I came to this, I didn't think I had an ego because I was meek and mild and shy and insecure. And so I didn't think I had an ego. And I remember sitting on the course and being like, actually, and I'd heard that Sid quote that, you know, your ego is everything you believe to be true about yourself in this world. I was like, ego is massive. The amount of belief I had about me, and how I was doing and what people thought of me and, it what you just, thought you were capable of. It was like me, 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 me. And it was innocent because I was like, I wanted to be a better person. I wanted to be better. I wanted to be the best. I wanted to, but it was all self-focused. And Sid realized and, and tried to describe to people like, stop looking at what you think. There's this power before. There's something before that creates our ability to think. There's this force. They're these principles, like look to them. And as it made sense to me because I'd spent 10 years in the psychology model talking about myself, 
and how I was doing and what I was scared of and what I think it was in my past that made me so messed up now and who I think had wronged me. Like I'd spent all this time in content and I was getting less and less free in my mind. I was getting sadder. I was finding things harder. Like it, it was the opposite direction of what I wanted, but it seemed like such a, a worthy pursuit because these people obviously know what they're, they're doing. There must be a, a, a method in the madness. But like you often say, you go in kind of being all right. And by the end of your session, you'd feel like shit because you just drag, dragged up all the worst things that ever happened to you. And, and like, it, it was so weird for me when I heard the principles being spoken about because I'd grown up thinking that that's what you needed to do to find happiness. That that's what you needed to do to find depth, to be like a, a deep spiritual person you needed to go through all your crap and search through it and it, it seemed to make sense but when I sat and listened to Roger speak about Sid's message and, and how he had woken up to it and how he had changed as a, psycho a psychologist through it it made so much sense like the, the logic of it is is watertight and I remember Roger saying I will speak to any human being about this stuff because it applies to them I can go into business. He spent a lot of time in very downtrodden communities in America, running projects with people. He would work with people in um, psych, psych wards that had kind of been written off. He'd work with children, he'd work with older people, like he'd work with anyone with any religion. Like he knew that regardless of what was showing up, these principles applied. And if people started to experience them for themselves, their life would start to change because it's in our identification with our story or our ego or our character that we get totally lost because we think that's who we are and that character will have limits. The idea that I was a shy person came with consequences because I showed up in the world and felt I was shy and I thought other people created that for me. Big groups of people made me shy. Having to speak in public made me shy. Having to answer the phone made me uncomfortable. Like, you can see that if you have that belief, it creates discomfort, but it's all content based. And everything that I, I, I have seen has never been about looking at me. It's been looking at what's universal. Hmm. What is universal? And like at the moment, this is a, a, a big, I feel like the world's in this huge shakeup with what's been happening in America, what's been happening with the coronavirus. Like, what is it that connects us? What is it that unites us? Like we, we, we know what it is that separates us. And well, we think we know what it is. We think it's difference. But we, when we start to look, well, what is it that's the same with us all? What creates experience for every single being on this planet? And when we look there, we feel more united. And I think one of my favorite, um, it's supposed to be something that uh, Jesus Christ said, and it's become like passers-by. See each moment for the first and last time. And I feel like in some ways that's, it's showing us the, the truth of something. We can't go back in time. We can think it, we can relive things in our mind, but it's always in this moment. There isn't going back. So, I could see how going back in my memory and regurgitating memories that had upset me, I got to experience it again and again and again now because reality only happens now. And it's like, wow, that this, the, the putting back together of thought and feeling for me at that time was huge. No wonder I felt like I felt because all I've done is look at what's wrong with me, what I don't like about myself, gone through my past, gone through people in my past, trying to figure out which one of them was the one that messed me up. And, and it was like, but I didn't realize that that kept a story alive now. And I remember it feeling like walking out, like this unlimited potential to think anything. If I'm not all of that stuff that I've already thought, then what am I? And it, what came to me was like, well, I, I can think anything. And I often describe it, it as like, I went out and I tried all kinds of characters. Like I got a bit arrogant for a bit and was like, oh, how could anyone ever be shy? It's just thought. And, and, and then sometimes I'd probably be a bit over the top, like a bit 
like especially around people I was more familiar with I'd, I'd be a bit over the top and talk a lot and I don't know like it's like I'd got to try on different ways of being and, and realizing I'm none of them I'm none of them and the other be beautiful thing that has come from all of this has been I see it in everyone I speak to mm. that we all get lost in our stories of who we think we are in one way or other and someone did a post today on Facebook about we will think we've seen through things but there'll be certain thoughts that we live out of that we just don't see so it's just how life is no it's all thought there's areas of our life that we think are immovable we couldn't ever see it differently because it's just the way it is and it's like yeah but it's because thoughts invisible to us so I think the more that we I often say it's like we get a bit suspicious of our own mind because we see how changeable it is like Dave was saying he does not if he puts on a t-shirt with okay now he does not feel like a runner no I, n I very rarely feel like going for a run now <clears throat> So you see how it's, and I think you see how we, we, blind, we blindly believe. Like when you often talk about it as children, we play with thought, we play with characters, we play with how we feel. And then at some point we have some thoughts about ourselves that we think, no, these are true. These are who I am. And then we live out of them, never questioning them. And we will do that in certain areas of our life till the day that we die like it will just be invisible and that's being alive and living like we get to be here and create characters but i feel like i remember it being described once at a conference like it's we've had a map for life but it's been upside down so we're constantly getting lost we're constantly getting afraid we're always ending up in places we didn't want to end up and and i said it's almost like suddenly someone's just going oh no your map's upside down now navigate life and I felt like that's what the gift was for me. Like I thought that I was a victim of my past. I was a victim of my genes. I was a victim of my personality. I was a victim of like, I had all these things. It's like, no, the only thing that you're up against is misunderstanding about who and what you are. And you've bought into a character as if that's who you are. And as soon as that grip loosens, and there's like, I think it was Ali, I was saying to you, like there's a, um, a Leonard Cohen quote that says, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. And I feel like if we can just have like a little chink in our armor, a little crack in our ideas of who we are, it can't help but allow light in. Mm. And another word for, for consciousness used to be light, a metaphor of light. The light of life. And that light can shine. Like there's been times where I've had that light shine on my own ego and it's been really uncomfortable i'm like wow i think like that but there's been other times it's just shone a light and i've just sat and basked in it and be like wow there is so much beauty that i have missed and i often describe the first um day i came home from learning about the principles i've been in london for three days and I'd been in a shared car back to my auntie's and then I got in my own car and driven back to my village. It was about a 25 minute drive, which I'd done a ridiculous amount of times before. And I remember on that drive, seeing buildings, noticing thatched cottage, uh, cottages, cottages, is? Cottage. cottages, is, is. yes, cottages. Um, and one of the thatch roofs had a, um, a pheasant, on it like made out of thatch and I was like how I wonder how long that's been there I've, I've never seen that and like just the colors of things and it was like I got to go home to a different village and the thought that came is where have I been because I've not been in my village I haven't been here I haven't experienced this and I realized I've just I lived my whole life in 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 my head I live my whole life in how am I doing, how am I feeling, what do people think of me? Da, 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 da. And I didn't realise that the direction that we're all looking for of peace of mind and happiness doesn't come from studying ourselves. It doesn't come from studying what we've already thought. Because if it was there, we'd have already found the answer. And I think just knowing that, I think allows us to be open to something new, 
and we catch ourselves quicker. Like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm studying myself again. Oh yeah, I'm making this all about me again. And it's like you get to wake up on a daily basis to the nature of our mind and you grow in respect for it. Like my levels of compassion and understanding for other people have gone through the roof. I used to be so judgmental and self-righteous because I didn't know that just because I thought it didn't mean it was true. And like thinking that I was always right. My dad used to say to me, do you want to be right or do you want to be kind? I'm like, oh, I want to be right. I'm pretty sure I am about most things. And it's like, it's pretty cool when you start, as that starts to fall away, what's revealed is what people talk about our true nature. And it feels like there is a, a nature to us that just isn't separate from nature. And someone said on the retreat we went, ran recently, a dog just knows how to be a dog. It doesn't go to dog school. It just knows how to be a dog. And it's like, we, we, we're, we're born into this life. We know how to live. But we kind of get lost in all of our ideas. And it's almost like just waking up again. Sid was saying, what a gift as a job or as a... Um, he didn't really see it as a job, I don't think he said. But you get to walk through life and you get to tap people on the shoulder and wake them up. Letting them know that they are the dreamer they can go back into the dream and often create more beautiful dreams and it, it does feel like my niece often says I don't know when I grow up whether I should get a real job or get a job like you and Dave because she doesn't think our job is a real job because we enjoy it <laughs> like we love we love when we run retreats and things it's not like it feels like a we've got something booked in we 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 enjoy and love talking to people about this <laughs> We know we're, we know we're lucky. We know we're very privileged people. And people <coughs> on this call have experienced their hour call turn into two hours or two and a half hours because we just can't Maybe shut up. But it's because there's there's been impact in our own life and people around us like we get to see that impact. And I often say, especially when I've done three day trainings. Like at the end of day two, I'm like, oh my God, no one's going to hear anything. This is really hard. And then on day three, what people come back with, and I'm like, wow, how did you hear that in what we've been talking about? And I think that's the, the magic of this stuff, that there's something that we're describing and point to and use stories and metaphors, but the message doesn't come in, in words and the message doesn't come from us to you. The message is... is it's like it wakes something up in us and then we start hearing from ourselves and like we become our own best teacher like i stop needing to go to therapy and coaches and counseling and hypnotherapy and kinesiology and all the things i used to try and do to get rid of feelings i didn't like and i started to realize, oh, I, I, i'm built to take feelings and sometimes i'm going to have ones that feel like tidal waves that knock me over but i can take those too and so can everyone else. So you stop looking. Like I, I don't see broken people. I don't see people who are beyond repair. I just see people that have got a story that looks really real to them. And as they look at it, it looks more and more real and it's all they can see. But in any moment, their focus could shift, even if it's just to, they're watching something funny on TV and they laugh. Like there's, a, there's the crack there. It doesn't exist in that moment that we're not thinking it. And I think the more people are appointed at this, like go and, go and live in your life and see, is this true for you? Can you see in your own life where you've been so fixed on something and then you've changed your mind? Or you've felt like you couldn't take any more of this feeling of sadness or grief or anger, but then at some point it's shifted. Like it's not that you have to believe anything that we say, but you get to, to, to consider it and see in your own life, is this true? Is it true that our minds change? Is it true that what we, we, we think creates a reality that we see and it looks true? But hang on a minute, I thought differently yesterday and everything looked completely different. So which one's true? What is reality? And I think we start asking deeper questions rather than how do I feel better? It's, it's almost like, what is this stuff? What is life? What is reality? What is it that's creating? And then it's like the reordering of our experience seems to happen. 
like the reordering of coming back to the truth of something is phenomenal like i i thought we had to study ourselves to improve but you can't improve on this being that's been created from something way beyond my intellect way beyond us there's a force that knew how to create all of this and that that's where the reordering happens it doesn't come from our intellect or our it comes from something before and it's because that beforeness is what we're we all are like with that, that you often describe it as being a blank canvas and then throughout life we paint on that canvas and we paint and we paint and we paint and we get lost in all of our creations and then we go to therapy and we look back all of our paintings and try and find the one that messed us up and and we study that and we study them and there might be some beautiful ones that we can bring to mind and look at and but to know that we're, we're none of we're none of that we're the we're the blank canvas and thought is the medium in which we paint i remember you saying that to someone on a call when i was i was sat there it's like i was learning from dave as he was sharing because i was like that is such a beautiful way of describing it because i know i've spent a huge amount of you know 10 years of my life often weekly sometimes twice a week going through my paintings that painting of what happened when you were three that painting of when you went to school and you had that experience, that painting of that time you were really scared, that painting of that, like looking at them. And I didn't, no one ever said, you're not those paintings. You're not those experiences, but you're the, the ability to create reality. You're the power. And like I know when we've done work abroad, there's been people who, I've had stories and lives that are unimaginable to, to me and it can almost feel like we're out of our depth but then I, I'll always remember the stories that, that Roger shared with us with, with communities he'd worked with and he just said no one no one is not this and he said and if you know that to be true when you speak to people regardless of their circumstance that will wake up in them and we've seen it again and again and I think there's one lady in particular at the end of our training in a charity in South Africa. She just, she looked like she hated us for most of the training. And at the end, she just was beaming. And she just said, I feel so powerful. I feel so powerful. I feel love. And I feel love. And she was like hugging us and like, we were, you're my yeah. brother, you're my sister. And you, see, you see that that, that is the true power of life. Mm. I, I, I was a man who, nah. Don't show love, that's weakness. I knew nothing. I was arrogant and I knew nothing. I know that the day that I realised that I could love people, I could love myself, I could fall in love with life itself. Love is the most powerful. Love heals everything. Conflict, it does nothing but create pain and pain creates pain love heals you know and it's like it's such an it's such an overlooked thing especially especially within the i feel like in the, the masculine kind of way we're brought up in the western world we'll be a proper man you know and, blah, blah, blah. and but i know now i i meet tough nuts i meet hard lads I met a lad I used to argue with in town. He was one of the hardest lads in town. I saw him the other day. I was like, how are you doing, man? He's like, whoa, you've changed. You've lost a lot of weight. You've got curly hair. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's mad, isn't it? I was like, it's really nice to see you, buddy. It's really, really nice to see you. And he's like, hey, it's really nice to see you. You're looking really well. I'm like, yeah, you too, man. It's really nice to see you. I know it's, I know it's supposed to be social distancing. And shook his hand like, it was a lad I used to fight with. Me and him had some horrible words and it was the first time I've seen him in such a long time and it was just nice just to go, that's done. Here's some, nice to see you. And I, I, I'll never forget that moment because it was such a beautiful moment. Both him and I looked each other in the eye and we, there was real gratitude to see each other. Where in the past there was total disdain. And I think, you know, when we start to look at love, it does seem too simple. It seems so simple. It's like, 
but that's the one thing I remember one time people have probably ever tell this story before but I've been so thankful for this conversation through 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 awakening to the the awakening that I that this this has developed for me within this life I've been so thankful for and one of the times I was especially thankful for it was when I was in South Africa and Jenny and I have been from Mill. Forgive me, people who've heard me tell this story. And Jenny and I went out for a meal. We're in the CBD of Cape Town. And I, I, we went for a meal and I left the wallet in the car, which was about a 10 minute walk away. And I mean, bearing in mind, I was a man who, if I had a problem, I sorted it out and it wasn't it wasn't sorted out with it was generally sorted out with intimidation and Fists. aggression and yeah being a dickhead it was my go-to you'll be safe if you can intimidate you'll be safe if you can beat down and we all have our you'll be safe if whether it's an addiction whether it's a whatever you know or something that keeps us I was even I feel safe when I'm depressed why? Because it's familiar. And that's somehow that, 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 that security of the familiar. Even if it's depression, I, I would sooner have that than the other because I don't know what that is. I have no idea what that would look like. And that terrifies me. I'm going to stick with depression because it's safe. Fucking hell, Dave. And I remember I was walking back down to the CBD of Cape Town and I noticed this man cross the street. I was dressed in all my nice Ted Baker things because we've been working in a charity this time. And I was dressed very smartly. And this I noticed this man crossing the road and he came up alongside me and he came right alongside me and he stood right on my shoulder. And he was like, give me some money. I said, uh, I said, I haven't got any money. He said, don't be stupid. Look at you. Give me, give me some money. I said, mate, you've picked a really bad day to do this. I said, you, I haven't even got my wallet on me. I said, sorry, dude, you can't have any money. I haven't got any. He's like, do not make me rob you. Give me some money. And at this point, four, three, four years ago, before this point, I would have put that man down. I would have leathered him. I would have probably got beaten up or stabbed or shot who knows i might have killed him he might have killed me i don't know but i would have reacted in a, in a way that i thought i had to react which was violence aggression you you will not talk to me like that how dare you talk to me do you know who i am kind of thing i had that kind of don't you speak to me like that And I remember I was walk I just carried on walking. This man was walking as close as me and Jenny. I know he was stood right on my shoulder. And the only thing that occurred to me in that moment was put your arm around me. And I just put my arm around this man. And I carried on walking. And I held him quite tight. I just held him there. And I just asked him, I said, So what's your name? Alex I said I'm Dave and after about three or four minutes we go back to the car I just had a conversation with this man and I just I just put my arm around him I'm not saying do this this isn't and I would say this and this isn't what to do in a situation like that it was just what occurred in that moment and it's not something I thought I would do I just put my arm around this man and carried on walking we got back to the car and by this time, this man had quietened down. I wasn't fueling the fire with more. I wasn't pouring acid on acid, creating a deeper, stronger acid. I was, for some reason, what occurred to me was pour alkali on this and the alkali was love. He was scared. For whatever reason, he was scared. And it was coming out in a, a feeling of lack and he needed stuff. Turns out he did. And before long, we go to the car and I just said to him, Alex, get in the car. 
and he was you could see he was totally on his back foot now we're like what the hell so alex just get in the car i'm not gonna hurt you and he jumped in the car and we drove up the road and i parked up and i was just chatting away to him it turns out he said he just got out of prison for burglary about 18 months before he said he doesn't want to be like he is he said i don't want to be it i said you know what mate i said i've been to prison i know what that's like he's like you've been to prison but you're white i said yeah well white people in in the uk they more often they go to prison as well so yeah i've been to prison as well mate it's not nice and he's like no it's not nice he said i've got a kid i've come out and in the 18 months i've been out i've had a baby he says and uh he said life's yeah life's difficult and i said to him i said are you hungry and he said yeah I said, right, there's Nando's across the road. Do you want to go there? And he went, no, 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 no. He said, if we're going to spend that money, can we go in that shop there? And we're parked next to a little convenience shop. And by this time, Jenny came down and went, what the fuck are you doing? I've been gone 40 odd minutes or something. I'd lost all track of times. I'm like, there's the wallet. Go and pay that lady. So we went in this little convenience shop and he bought, he bought Mealy Pop, which is like a... An, staple, like rice. Yeah, ricey kind of staple. Um, which is a, quite popular in South Africa. He bought tea bags, he bought long life milk, he bought sugar, he bought hot, no, he didn't buy porridge, did he? He bought um, nappies. nappies. And then he stood there and he said, and can I get this box of biscuits? Chocolate biscuits. He said, because I want to sit down with my friends and I want to share these out and I want to tell them all about you. I said, Alex, get, get what you want, mate. And he went, that's it. Did I mention toilet rolls? So we bought this stuff. He didn't take the piss. He just kind of got everyday stuff. And I said, right, where do you live? He said, I live on the side of uh, Table Mountain. I said, can we run you home? And he said, yeah, because he had a couple of bags of stuff. He said, can we pick up my girlfriend on the way? And as we drove up, there was a girl stand on, stood on the street corner. Beautiful looking girl, all her makeup done. We picked her up and she was like, what are you doing in this white people's car? You could see it. So it was like, and we're driving along and we're driving over towards Clifton. And all of a sudden he went, stop. Can you stop here? Just stop here by this gate. I said, all right, what are we stopping for? He said, oh, this is where I live. And I said, you live here? Where? There was nothing. He said, I live in, in there. And I looked into this field and I was like, where, Alex, where do you live? And he went, in the bottom corner. And I looked and there was this little pile of tarpaulins. I said, that's your home? Yeah. I said, okay. So I got out and got his bags and helped her out and said to Jenny, you stay in the car. I said, can I come and see your home? And he, went, he just laughed at me and looked, no. He said, you're not, you're not safe in there, Dave. He said, come here. He said, you can come as far as this. And but then I noticed there were other little tarpaulin tents in this field. And then with that, like four or five fellas saw me and stood up and started walking over towards me. And he just said, Dave, you have to go now. You're not safe now. You have to go. And he just gave me a hug. And that was the last I saw of him. And I gave him a hug back and I got back in the car and we drove off. I remember being so grateful to have, for whatever reason, that aspect of ego within myself that felt the need to put people down, to beat people down, to over, overcome people, to over. I was so thankful that I came from love in that moment. I would have ended up in a fight with a really beautiful man who had nothing, who had mouths to feed, who didn't have a ways and means given his criminal record of making money. And I would have beaten that man or he would have beaten me one way or another nobody would have won 
but I feel like in this, the outcome that came, there were two winners and it was the fact that we both got to connect and and fall into love with one another. So that speaks a little bit to the a question of, you know, if we're not our ego, like they're on board kind of agree, but if we're not our ego and we're not the sum of our experience, then who are we? And what are those moments of clarity? Are they another form of ego? So I think that's a beautiful question. And when you were speaking, it's like people often say, no, what's underneath it all? And it's like love. And it sounds like you always say it sounded so hippie. But another, um, we often say to people, I know there's a couple of people who are, are newer on here that, you know, we're not um, religious, but there's certain quotes and things that we've heard in different religions that we, we love. And we, so we do mention sometimes people and uh, another um, quote that's supposed to be from Jesus was when someone asked, well, uh, who, who are we? Where are we? They're saying it's like the age old triple question. Mm. Who are we? Where are we going? Where did, where we, did come we come from? from? Where do we, where, we, where, where did we come from? Where are we going? And who are we? And then the answer was, tell, tell them we, we came from the light. We're moving toward the light. We are the light. And the light again was a metaphor for consciousness. We, we, we came from consciousness. We are moving towards consciousness. We are consciousness. And again, like who we are isn't a thought or a thing. It's, it's the capacity to. Yeah. Think. And it's like, it's a beautiful thing. To, what are those moments of clarity? Are they another form of ego? It's like, as soon as anything comes into form, then it's ego. But like Dave was saying, the moment, that he got to experience clarity, his actions were very different, like mm. with Alex. When he would have just come from his almost pre-programmed, this is who I am, I protect people, I don't take any shit. Blah, blah, That's blah, why blah. I ended up in prison. If he if he'd come from that in that situation in South Africa, it could have gone very, very wrong. And it feels like we get to be more present in the moment and responsive rather than reactive. Because if we think we know who we are, then we know how we react in this situation, then we're more likely to always act that way in that situation. But actually, if we realize that every single moment is new, every moment is fresh. So we, we find ourselves more present, um, more responsive, less reactive, because we're in the moment where life is actually taking place. And that's where we're best fit to live because it's, it's what's happening. What isn't happening is all of our memories and our beliefs and ideas of who we are that's that's all gone that's all been formed and that's stuff and it feels like you get more present and that presence is another word that describes who we are hmm. it's presence. that it's that passer byness it's like become passers by Under, understand you are seeing each moment for the first and last time understand you are forever forever for the rest of our lives we are seeing each moment for the first and last time such a, a fundamental thing to become aware of again we, what we talk about what we try to talk about of is is the fundamental nature of life as best we possibly can in the moment given given how we are in any given moment. You know, sometimes we feel like we're plugged into the mains and sometimes we don't. We're, we're, we're ever-changing people. This is the nature of life. Sometimes we feel like we're wide awake and full of inspiration and sometimes we don't. You know, and it's like this is the nature of each moment. It's a, it's a unique expression of consciousness. We forget that. Each moment is a unique expression of consciousness. And this is the reality that we are encountering, that we call our life. And I think for so long, people have been trying to do life, trying to get it right, trying to figure out how to get life. How do I do life properly? Tell me, tell me, how do I do life properly? That's why we go and see doctors and therapists and we become engaged in these kind of conversations. 
I'm one of these people, certainly. I've spent an awful lot of my life trying to get life right. Trying to do what I've thought is the right thing. More often than not for other people. And what other people think of me. It's all worried about what other people thought of me. But I think, I think when I came across this, I realised it was that search. That search. I was on this continuous search for acceptance and love. It's all I was ever searching for. When I was a hard man, I wanted to be accepted. When I was a family protector, the reason why I went to prison, because I'm a family protector and I want people to feel safe in my presence. I want people to love me. Yeah, I'll go and batter somebody down. and You know, and I spent an awful lot of my life doing that. Only when I woke up to whatever it is you want to call it, I found that the acceptance and love was within me, for me. And the moment I realised that acceptance and love exists within me, for me, I didn't need any, I don't care what other people think of me. I've got people who really love me. I've got people who really do not love me. And it, it's cool. That's live. That's totally live. But I was, I was thinking just before as you were speaking, I'm probably going to take this off a bit of a tangent now, but it was just something I, I, I've, so many of my observations about life have come through looking at nature. Those, that, those people that know me know I love nature and I'm writing a book. I have been for frigging years now. Three years. Three years about, um, about my observations of nature and how they are observations that I've had into nature that point to the divine. Because it is truly the divine that we're seeking. That's what we're searching for. I often call it, we spend an awful lot of time polishing a turd, trying to get a shine on a piece of shit. We never manage to shine up a piece of shit. It just smears and goes all ugly and horrible. That's when we're trying to fix ourselves. That's when we're trying to become a better me. It's like polishing a turd. People come to us, how long have you been trying to fix yourself? 20 years? Managed? No. Oh, it's interesting. Interesting. And then we'll point out to them the point that, have you ever considered that what you're trying to fix was never broken in the first place? <laughs> Sorry, Lisa. I will, when I can be asked. Lisa said, hurry up and finish the bloody thing. I'm assuming you're not talking about this talk, but my book. Are you talking about this talk? The talk. The talk, Lise. You and I are going to... She's shaking her head. No, 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 no. I will, when I, when I can be bothered. The thing is, it hasn't even taken three years. What he wrote was written over about a three-week three yeah. period. It just, like... It sat it was there awake, on the computer for three it weeks. It was awake three, in yeah. the middle of the night, and it was just coming through. And yeah. he read me all these chapters. I'm like, oh, my God, you're going to have your book. I think this is in, like... January, February time. I was like, yeah. your book's going to be finished by April if you keep going like this. And then it just stopped. It just <laughs> and then he's gone back and tried to edit his own <laughs> book. I'm like, just write the damn thing and give it to an editor to I've edit. I've read one book in my life and I'm not very good at England. So, but It'll get written. so many of my observations have come from observations of the natural world. And they're observations that have helped me realise or found ever i'm find i look for evidence of the divine that i can share with people that are obvious to people and look i look for stories that i can relate to as in within my own life within the natural world because one of the really obvious things that became obvious to me when i woke up was it was through an, it was through looking at a jackdaw and i realized oh the jackdaw is a conscious thinking state the crow is a conscious thinking state. So am I. So are we all. Oh shit, I can't be a tree surgeon now because a tree is a conscious thinking state. Science is baffled by that. I've mentioned this before as well, but in the back of one of my Arb mags, Arb, Arboriculture Tree Surgery magazines, there was this chapter on tree responses to pests. And the very, very, very last sentence was, 
We know trees think, but we do not know how because they do not have a brain. We know trees think. These scientists know that trees think. Why? Because they communicate. They send out messages to one another. They respond in the moment. They are aware. We know trees think, but they, we do not know how because they do not have a brain. And this is such a fundamental sticking point that people are so adamant on sticking to that the idea that brain creates thought and consciousness we do not know how it, we, it's a mystery to us because the trees don't have a brain yet they're conscious and can think it doesn't make sense but we're, st but we're sticking to it we're not going to budge on that point that somehow brain creates consciousness and thoughts and I think when people start to realize now consciousness enlivens brain, thought comes through brain, thought and consciousness are the same power that enlivens life itself. This is life. When consciousness evacuates the physical, the brain's still intact. It stops frigging thinking though. What's missing? The life part, the light, the light of life has gone. Wake up, science. Come on. I know there's an awful lot of scientists out there who don't think like that, but there are so many who do. I was listening to Brian Cox. I love Brian Cox. I was listening to him talk the other day about the bullshit, about how these chemicals come together to form the fabric of life. No, no, life is a state of consciousness. The chemicals are a, a consequence of consciousness. Go to the before the chemicals and you will find life. You're not at all passionate. About I'm this. not at all passionate. Anyway, but anyway, don't get me started. On that me. I've obviously got started now, but I, it was such a. I did. I was just thinking about what I could talk about before. But a few days ago, we've got mice. Right, we live in woods. I'd show you now, but it's raining. People who've been to our house know we live in a woodland and. We get a lot of wood mice and I love them, but they're right little shits. In the middle of the night, you hear them chomping on stuff, chewing up your carpet and eating your down jacket. And they're in the caravan, weren't they? We've just cleaned out and- They've been in the bed. Been in the bed. They've eaten our deodorant. It's like, they're, every, they're just little bastards they are, but I love them. And I've put this same mouse out now, God knows how many times, to the point where I saw it I got out of bed at about one o'clock in the morning, I put the light on and I sat down. I sat down with the mouse right in front of me, a foot in front of me and I was like, right, look mate, you and I are gonna have to come to some form of agreement here. I can't keep waking up in the middle of the night. It was ignoring my mouse trap now because it's wise, it's, it's, it's become aware, it's not stupid. It's So I was sat there talking to this mouse and it, it, it was so cocky, it sat there, washed its face in front of me. And then it started to walk towards me. So I put my hand out. I was like, get on my hand. We're going out. And it walked towards me and it got to just about level with me. And it went poof underneath my bed. I'm like, oh, bollocks. I've totally been nutmegged by a mouse. <laughs> anyway. So I went back to bed and I woke up in the morning. No mouse. The next day I set the trap. I moved the trap. I put it outside, the, outside our bedroom. And I went down and the little bugger was in there. It's about six o'clock at night. And I was like, right, you little shit. I am taking you bloody miles away. So I took it. I know it's not far enough away. It was about a five, five, seven minute it's walk. It's supposed to be two miles. It's supposed to be two miles, probably. We don't like separating families. No, so you see, it? then we've got this guilt thing about, you know, it's terrible. <laughs> so I took it to the far end of our land. We've got a, bit, a little bit of land a bit further on from our house and my sister's building got planning permission to build a house and this land is it's been totally left so we're on this land there's loads of trees and the, the elder flowers at the moment are beautiful and the foxgloves and the vetches and but lisa's having a house built so we've had a massive part of this land i took this mouse let it go first direction it went was in the bloody house direction it probably beat you home. It didn't even run. It just kind of got out of the trap. It kind of looked at me and looked in this hole and turned around and started walking back towards the house. And I was walking back across the land where my sisters had this land dug. And 
the first time she had it done, we walked onto it. I was gutted. It was just barren. It was barren where all this beauty once stood. It was just barrenness. It was soil. There was a big trench dug for the foundations and I was gutted. I, I really felt really sad for the land. I was like, I felt really sad. And it was, it was only when I took back this mouse, I took this mouse to its new home, that I started to notice how it was nearly covered over again. It was almost to the point where you could not see the damage that had been caused. The grass was coming through, bracken was coming through, um, blackberry, the, um, the briar, the bramble was coming through, uh, foxgloves, vetches, and these beautiful flowers. I have no idea what they are. I'm going to have to look them up. They look like some very small kind of pea. They have these little... Um, tendrils that kind of curl off to go in search of things like really really tiny look like a tiny little pea or something in the pea family really beautiful things and I noticed this land this scar is now healing one of the things I'm really passionate about is reuniting humanity with nature to realize that human beings we are the natural world too there is no separation between human being and nature it's a false split it's a false split it's a di and it's a it's a split that is allowing people to do terrible things to all kinds of other beings that oh you don't don't put human emotions on animals they're not human emotions they're animal emotions we are an animal animals are my rusty is, is just as capable of fear as he is love just the same as me he gets inquisitive when you chop your nails he's like what are you doing he, he get you show him a transformer you know like the kids transformer his nose is on it he's like he can't believe it for some reason he loves he loves a leatherman he loves it. He will stare at a Leatherman for bloody, he's like, what's it doing? Inquisitive, just really inquisitive. Cows, you walk through a field, you lie down in a field, a cow's going to come and look at you and come and sniff you. Before no, I, you I tried to do yoga in a field of cows when you were metal detecting. And before I knew it, I literally had like 20 cows in a semicircle around me, like watching me. And it was, it was a bizarre, they're so interested. Some of them are like more kind of confident. forthcoming and confident. And some of them have got these little timid personalities and you see they are personalities. You know, it's like, no, no, they, they are, what we call a human being is an animal too. We are nature. And so I, I like to look at in nature, I, I should I say, I seem to see in nature aspects of me. And what I try and what I don't try and look for, but what seems to show up for me within my awareness is is obvious signs of the divine and similarities between us and it. And it's like just seeing that land without effort, without me needing to go out and sow seed, sow seed, plant plants. The land has recovered. My dog's just got stood on twice. Lise, yeah, yeah, you can go see Rusty because he just got stood on, bless him. I said him, yelp. Without effort, this land has recovered. You know, it, it, this is what happens for people. Sometimes in life, our life gets thrown up in the in the air. Sometimes things happen in life that you know, look for all intents and purposes like this is permanent. When I saw that land scarred like that, it looked like it was permanent. It's forever going to be like this. This is terrible. I, I hate this. This is terrible. This is terrible. I cannot believe it. And a few weeks on now, this land is looking beautiful again. Is not not like us. 
is that not just like us is it not just like us insofar as i look at all these faces on the screen now and i know that every single one of us has been hurt and felt pain and anguish and it's looked permanent and immovable only for without effort it's now a memory that we look back on and go wow that was a really hard time glad that's passed that's the nature of nature that is the nature of nature we are nature the nature of nature is constant change constant change our biggest fear is that something is going to turn out terrible forever that's our biggest fear i'm sure it is it's going to be like this forever what's death like oh <gasps> well it's darkness forever forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever forever forever oh no forever a depression oh i'm gonna feel like i'm gonna feel like this forever we don't without effort the beauty grows back do we notice it not all the time i've walked over that bit of land and i hadn't noticed the beauty growing back until this time i was carrying the mouse across it wow look at the beauty here look at the beauty born of this scar Got all these flowers look at all these vetches born of this scar in fact there's more flowers in this scarred area there is in the grassy areas this to me appears more beautiful because of the scar you know and people are medicating the shite out of themselves trying to escape feelings because we're afraid of this we're afraid of our experiences. Now, I don't know if this is true or not. But I feel like challenges in life create growth. If we start to get eyes for learning and if we are prepared to learn our lessons, I know that the greatest gifts that have ever happened to me in my life are when my life has been dug up and scarred and thrown to the sides and piled up and gone. And it's looked permanent and it's looked immovable. And I've thought I have ruined my life. Going to prison, breakdown of my marriage, drink, drugs, depression. But those have actually been some of the greatest gifts that have ever happened for me in my life. I remember when Sue asked me, would I ever change anything? And I said, no, I wouldn't change anything about my life. I wouldn't. Why not? It's so valuable to be able to learn those lessons. So valuable. It makes my life easier now having done that. I'm somebody who learns things the hard way. I'm not somebody to be told, don't do that. It's hot. Don't touch that. It's hot. Is it? <laughs> ah, bloody okay. That is really hot, isn't it? Or wet paint. Is it? You know, I, I'm one of those idiots. I don't. Mark, I see you nodding. Are you nodding because you, you kind of, you're agreeing that I'm an idiot? Or are you nodding because you... Are also an idiot. You're nodding because I'm, yeah, I'm an idiot. Okay, fine. Yeah, sometimes it's... It's through the hard times, the things that we're all trying to escape, that are truly the greatest gifts that are brought to us in life. And just going back to that death thing, I mean, when I, I've had my awakenings, my experiences as a divine, I've been fortunate enough to have been able to see that this is a spiritual existence. And when I say spiritual, that's just a word. It's a, there is a force behind this reality that is ever present, doesn't die, cannot die. It's the same as for everything and everybody. We're all one thing. Everything is one. 
but I know that there are people in history who have seen far deeper than me and I get to learn from them. And one of them is that saying that Jen came up with, like when, when we come to death, you know, what is it that truly is dying? And the, it is that saying of Jesus when he spoke up and he was asked, who are, where did we come from? Who are we and where are we going? That ancient triple question, as it's called. The ancient mystery of life. Who are we? What is humanity? Where did it come from? Where are we going? And his answer. You come from the light. You are going towards the light. You are going to go back to the light. But in the meantime, you are the light. It's all one thing. Birth, death, life. They're all different expressions of consciousness. They're all different illusions of consciousness. We favour some over others. We favour life over death. Life good, death bad. But without death, there can be no birth. Without birth, there can be no death. Without death, there can be no life. And without life, there can be no death. They're both different sides of the same coin. What we're truly afraid of is the unknown or our ideas of what we think the unknown is. Which is one of, our, uh, one of the people we know spoke about. He said, well, you're not in the unknown. You've got an idea of what you think it is. The unknown truly isn't scary because it's not flavoured. He it's, said, you're not afraid of the unknown. You're afraid of what your concept of the unknown is. Exactly. Yeah. Which isn't the unknown. It's your concept. I was like, that is a really good way of putting it. Yeah. You're not, you're not in the unknown. You're in an idea. But you can, all, I also saw today, I, we, I had to take Rusty to the vet because he's hurt his leg. We're not sure. It's been a few days and like he was fine. I was holding him and then he realized we're at the vet. Like, he, I don't know how he picks up on it, but he knows. And then he just, like, starts trembling. And then this vet comes out with a mask on, and he's, like, trembling even more. And I have to give him to this lady. And he's looking at me like, really? You give, and he, Please don't put a thermometer on my butt. He, he turned around and, like, looked at me the whole way that she walked. And then she has to t collect him from the car park and take him in. And normally you get to go in with him. And, like, he was absolutely terrified. And then mm. ten minutes later she brings him out, and he's like, give him back to me and he, he calms down and then he's off and he's scratching around and stuff and it was like he was scared he didn't know where he was going he didn't know what was going to happen and he was scared and it's like you just see how natural it is we're like, we, we judge ourselves because we're scared or we, we, we make up there's something wrong with us but so much of what I've learned about life has come from watching Rusty like he gets totally freaked out he can be anxious he gets um aggressive he can be Sometimes you can hold a grudge. Yeah, like you just see, he's just, but it doesn't seem like he moulds things over for long periods of time afterwards. No. Like he might try and stay a bit annoyed with you. Like if we left him for the day, we'll get back. He's so excited to see us, but he'll also be growling because it's like, you need to know that yeah. you left me and you crashed it. And you just see, he's just, he's just, an ex he's just experiencing life and it's moment to moment. And one moment he's on my lap and he's being this cute. I might do something he doesn't want me to do and he bites me and then it's like and then he's in the next moment and you know quite a few scars yeah, it's just staying alive that's not actually from him that's from the other one yeah but i think you see like we judge ourselves for feeling and then we think there's something wrong with feeling and we become afraid of feeling but when you look at any other animal they they feel all they feel all the things that we feel fear love joy whatever anxiety but it seems we seem to have that extra layer of like talking about it thinking about it going, getting medicated for it going to the doctors for it because we think there's something wrong with it there's something wrong with us and i feel like that's such a that's one of the biggest mistakes we've made in humanity like oh there's something wrong with feelings there's something to fear in feelings oh there's something that's normal there's a normal and like we're scared of what we create so we might have dark thoughts or angry thoughts or mean thoughts and and then we're taught that they're wrong too so not only have you got to worry about your own experience you have to worry about what you think and the thoughts that you have and and you see how no wonder we're all getting neurotic like 
but what if like I know that um, Linda Pettit one of the ladies who shares this worked with one of the kids in the school shootings and um, she just said I wish I could have got to that school and done some work before all of this had happened she said because this kid she said as she was speaking to him I don't know how many sessions she had done but she just said he went if I'd known this stuff if you taught me about this before I, I wouldn't have done it and she said what, what do you mean he said when I was walking down the hall he said I had my hand in my bag on the gun and he said and there was this calm and it said you don't have to do this you don't have to do this and he said I didn't know to listen to that so he went with like the urgent angry one and she said it was such a uh, she saw such beauty in this kid he acted on a thought he, he'd felt bullied he'd felt victimized she could see what he created these bad people hurting him and he was and she just said but it's like as soon as she told him that he had everything he needed inside of him he recognized it had been there but he didn't know he didn't know to trust it and it's like we we get so afraid of feelings and we put them on people we put them on places mm -hmm. like you know he put that on his teachers he put it on his classmates he felt bad he felt victimized he blamed the world and then he acted out of that and like but when Linda worked with him, she just said, she just saw this beautiful kid who's got so lost and then, you know, that's going to impact the rest of his life because there are consequences. But she just said it was, you, you see how innocent we are in our action because we get so lost in our own thought creations. And if we don't know that's what it is, we blindly act out of it. Hmm. And I think I know how blindly I act out of thought every single day. And I feel like this is just, you get to wake up to it quicker. You get to take it less seriously. You maybe just give yourself a bit of time for it to shift and you've become less reactive and more responsive. And I think that's something that at the moment the world could do with is people getting more present with themselves, recognizing what they are, not going with the first thought that they have, not believing every thought that comes into their mind. But we're never taught to question that we're just because we're born we're, we're born into it and you can see how innocent it is and when you were speaking the other day i was saying how when we're asleep if we're deep enough in sleep we've still got our ears they still have all the in our brain everything's still there but we don't hear we sleep through things and i'm like you can see that consciousness is needed for us to experience because the physiology is there but we're not we're not in the, like there's times when I've been asleep and you've been in and out of the room, you've done things and I have no idea because I wasn't conscious. So you start seeing how con but your consciousness, consciousness is still there. The consciousness is fundamental for experience. I'm probably in a, in a dream or something, but it's like the physiology is there, but it's not experiencing what's going on around because experience is inside. And you see how in the same way we can dream at night and like I'm often waking up like, I have all kinds of weird dreams and waking up with my heart pounding and and it feels real and there's been times I've actually been sort of arsy with you all morning like I knew I had a dream where he was an idiot and I know it's a dream but I still punish him for a few hours because I can't it seems so real who am me and you see how but that's what's happening every day like times when we've had disagreements I've said I know that I've created a character for you in my head and it's so real and that's who you are and you're out of order and but that's always what we're doing and i've said to you like how can we be on a drive south which we do normally do a lot because my family live down there we're sat next to each other listening to music and i can glance over in one moment and just think you're wonderful and isn't life great 10 20 minutes down the road i'm in a whole story about what you did or didn't do and and i look over and you look like a, a terrible person you need help but the amount of people I speak to about that, they're like, that's so true. The amount of people I've spoken to are like, who can argue with someone who's passed away in their mind. They can hold a grudge against someone who's not I even on this planet. I've kinds of mad conversations with people. Donald Trump. Donald Trump and other people. I've all kinds of mad, mad conversations with people they've never even met. But the beautiful thing, you start to see whatever we think we experience. So if I'm in, if you're in an argument with Donald Trump in your head, you're experiencing that now, whether regardless of whether it's actually happened or happening, we experience now, we experience thought now. And you can see why then when we talk about our experience in the 
the um, therapy model, we kept reliving awful things over and over and over again now. Expecting to find beauty and peace and peace through looking at turmoil. And this isn't to say don't look at like sometimes reflection can be helpful. We can learn. We can look back at times in our life and learn. So you see everything's opportunities, but it's like you don't have to. And I feel like that reordering happens for us. Like we don't have to tell people how to live. No. Start to question and get a sense of what reality is. What's, what's it made from? Who are we? What are we? And, and this can only ever be experienced. You know, this isn't this isn't something where we come to where we learn. This you often describe it as an unlearning. This isn't something that we come to to try and remember. This is something we're going to kind of talk to in the hope that within an individual there will be this little kind of glimmer where somebody's kind of sat there going, "I can't put my finger on it, but I know there's something in this." And then sooner or later, it reveals itself to them. And it starts to reveal and the question of what are those, mom those moments of clarity are they another form of ego it's like well when we get clarity it's you it's so simple when it's around this conversation when something becomes clear it becomes simple when something is simple it's clear and moments of clarity that people talk about are when all of a sudden the simplicity of life is revealed and they become aware of it via thought, comes via thought, comes called insight, revelation, enlightenment, whatever anybody wants to call it. It's like in those moments of clarity where all of a sudden life suddenly becomes so obvious. Oh, bloody hell. It's that simple. It, it, it's that it's that simple it's that stuff those are those moments of clarity are they another us form of ego they can become ego because we can really hold on to that but in that moment it hasn't come from ego because it hasn't come from the intellect intellect is form thought taken form the intellect's everything we've already learned the intellect is what we go to to try and figure out problems. You know, when I put down my keys, I can't find my bloody keys. I go to my intellect and all right, where would I have put them? Where would I have put them? I'm pretty sure I put them on the side. So I'll go to the side and I'll check. No, they're not there. Okay, whereabouts did I put them? I'll check over there. No, I'm sure I put them on the side. I'll go back and check. No, they're not there. Are you sure they're not there? They're definitely not there. Where's those bloody keys up? I go to my intellect. And then I'll have checked the side 10 times, having already established the first time it wasn't there. And I'll have checked over and I'll check my pockets. And then I'll be minding my own business. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes an answer. It's usually when I'm not looking for it. What's that person's name? I can't remember the bloody name. Half an hour later, a day later, two o'clock in the morning, here it comes. Oh, is that? Oh, shit. Of course it was. So simple. And you see, it's like but when, when, when these kind of insights fall upon the nature of life itself, then we're starting to find something magical. We're starting to reorder the way that we think about reality. We're starting to reorder the way that we think about life, about ourselves, about one another. And that is, that is genuinely what this world if it if it um, if it if we're in the idea that it needs saving in the first place it's what it needs that's what it needs it needs people to think differently it's like when we were in south africa and they were saying the problem's too big no it's not the problem between black and white isn't too big it's a belief thick the moment the beliefs change south africa will change it will thrive the moment people drop their ideas, their thought, once people start to think differently about one another, the reality of the country will change and it will thrive because it's got beautiful people with beautiful minds that just aren't being utilised. It's that bigger problem. It's a thought. 
The problem of South Africa is a thought. The problem of depression is a thought. The problem of anger is a thought. The problem within a relationship is a thought. The problem of um, within politics is a thought. The problem of the way human beings interact with nature is a thought. It's a thought, it's a thought thick. Always. Because it's all created from thought. It's that simple. When people start to see it, like Jen said earlier on, it reorders things for us. Suddenly the reordering takes place within the mind. We don't need to reorder the mind. Did we order the mind in the first place? No. The mind looks after itself. The mind's beautiful. The biggest problem is when the ego tries to run the mind. Me, Dave, I'm trying to sort my mind out. I leave my mind alone. I'm like that bit of barren land. It re-establishes itself with new beauty, effortlessly, without any intervention from me. And that's what people are waking up to time and time again. They're waking up to this point that without effort, things change. They can feel better. They can feel happier. They can find more beauty. They can find more mystery. They can find more intrigue in life. They can find more presence. And it's not through efforting and trying to change ourselves. It's by leaving ourselves the hell alone like the pit of scarred land and allowing the new growth to come through and be beautiful and bloom. And everybody, everybody and everything is that. Questions? Yeah, I'm just realised the time. Does anyone have any questions or comments? You can either put it in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. Should be um, I can't unmute. Oh yeah, no. Hey, I'm to unmute, unmute you. Um, I love seeing Rusty. It just yeah. it makes my day. It, it really does. Um, yeah. I just it, I can't tell you what it does to me. Um, but um, this young girl's been coming down to the yard with me. Um, to to the horses, and I thought, what is it with this girl? She's just kind of vacuous always comes down with perfect hair you know to muck out horses and and stuff and i just felt there was something else going on and i we were walking to do the hair and i said see netty the one that's always laughing and raucous and stuff i said she's suffered from depression since she was 20. did you see sue that's always giving it mouth i said she wears badges of ptsd bipolar and she wears these badges proudly. You know, this is me. This is who I am. I said, you see Jess, the gobby one there. Da, 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 da. I said, she has her shoes. I said, lots of people have. I just had a feeling there was something going on with her. And uh, and then she just said, and she's really nervous with my horses. I mean, like totally trembling. Um, mind you, Big Ned did put her in A&E last week. So... She said, um, I suffer with anxiety. And she told me, I said, what's been going on? And, and it was just lovely because I said, you should be really excited. And she said, why? I said, because this is the first day of the beginning of the rest of your life. And just told her a little bit. I said, because I can't describe it in words about this conversation and it was just lovely and i was dead excited for her because i was like you should be really excited today and she's like whoa i said because this is the first day for the rest of, of the rest of your life i said you should be really excited too so i just pointed her in this direction and um and she's kind of quite excited too I don't know, it was just lovely. Um, and then, so I'd had a really lovely day and I get down to my field, which I'm in negotiations with the council about, but it's taking so long, so, so long, emails going backwards and forwards. And I get down there to find, today to find that this is big notice on it saying, 
no grazing on this land, uh, horses found on this land will be so uh, taken and sold, uh, the property of Lancashire County Council. I was like, what, what? And I've spent hundreds of pounds maintaining this field, taking 80 odd bottles of drinks bottles and cleaning it all up. So I knocked on um, Barbara's, Margaret's door, who are joining, sorry, I'll get to the point. And uh, I said, did you see the council today? And she says, see you, see you. She says, the, the other day what you said to me, uh, she's Scottish by the way. And um, she said, when, when the, the gas man was there and, I, and you said, what's up? And I said, oh, my, my boiler's gone. And you said, oh, how are you coping and that? And, and uh, she says, well, I, I said, I'm, I'm all right because I'm still I'm be able to have a shower. And you said, I wondered what the smell was. I said, oh, my daughter heard you saying it. And she said, did you hear what that woman said about you? She said, I've been in there, I've, for three days now I've been raging, raging. And it was me that rang the council and got your horses taken off their land. And I wasn't bothered that she had lost me my field. I was bothered that I had made her feel like that that I had made this human being feel feel like that. And all I could feel was, was love and sorrow. And I just got down on my knees and said, I just, you have to believe me. I don't care about the field at this moment in time that you've taken away my horse's field. But the, the, the fact that I, and I just felt from this, and I could have t easily turned around and said, get a fucking sense of humor for fuck's sake. You've just lost me in my fucking field. But I just felt this overwhelming sense of love that I'd made this other human being feel like that for like three days. And, um, but, and I just had this feeling of peace and I just thought, it'll be all right it, with the field. It will all come good. And just don't worry about it. And uh, yeah, that's it really. And I hate seeing plants dying outside shops. Because I just feel like the plants, when you were saying about the trees being chopped down, I feel like the plants outside, asters and stuff are going, uh, give me some water, give me some water. You know, and this is, this is it when we separate, when we split consciousness up, when we go human beings, consciousness, thought, animals, less so plants, not. Yeah. It's like one of the things that, you, you look at any universal conversation, whether it be religion, whether it be non-duality, whether it be principles, whether it be philosophy, theosophy, those kind of things, they're always put you quantum physics. Mm. They're constantly pointing to the oneness nature of yeah, life. Yeah. Yeah. So it's in that, you know, to, to find that space of oneness and is you don't, you d the outside can be a guide but the way where we see it is within is that that's why i talked about nature a lot N nature's a guide yeah yeah and experience takes place within and it's in that separation that we've created this false separation that we can do that to plants we can leave plants just to dry out and do nothing uh, they don't I, feel anything it's, it's almost like, like some i know it's like people say that's totally over the top but i feel like it's like they should be held responsible the supermarkets for saying these plants don't matter sorry and i know like people would say you're just weird and 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 when it's daffodil time and they just stack them all up without any water and i just hear the daffodils going i need to drink and i find i just yeah, yeah. anyway At there some you go. Point, i genuinely believe that we will wake up to that point and we will start yeah. to treat I know. I know. I all just, of the beings as as as, as family because at the end of the day i, I it, it's soppy probably but i do tend to view all other living beings as as family because yeah. we're all born of the same place we are all family we're all related because we're all unified and do you know what they won't let me take the plants home 
they won't let me take the plants home. Let me just take the plants home and I can save them. No, no, madam, no, you can't do that. And they'll throw them away and just, yeah, they're just, grieves me. That's, that's the way people think. Some people think differently. Yeah. I just wanted to say also about um, what you shared about your, your the, the neighbour to the field. It's probably if somebody had asked you yesterday or this morning, how would you react if someone lost you the field where your horse is? You'd probably think you'd be mad or you'd shout at the person or... Yeah. But it's almost like in the moment you kind of saw, wow, that woman is really suffering. Really hurt. I made a, a flippant comment and she took it so personally that she suffered and felt angry and upset yeah. for three days to the point where she's now... And you see how the reordering starts to happen. Yeah. So much of us act out of, we take things personally, we take other people's moods personally. And so many people that we speak to start having examples, like they might go, oh yeah, I'm not really understanding anything. Or I don't know what I've understood. But you start to ask them about their day-to-day -day life and things that have happened. And they start to notice, like normally I'd be reactive, but actually all I felt was compassion. They surprised themselves. Didn't yeah. They? Much. we we then get to experience that like i remember it being described as we are the first recipient of what we think and i remember just and the person then stopped it was a big talk a guy called keith blevins and he just stopped and he said just consider that we're the first recipient of what we think and you mm. see that, like we are the first recipient of our judgment we are the recipient of our anger like we then might into the world, like bring it into the world in a way, but it feels like we we get to experience more of the, the beautiful things because life isn't personal. Like that woman's what that woman has done isn't personal to you. Mm. In that moment, you saw that, and compassion was what occurred. And and I'm kind of really glad, in a really weird way, I might think about it differently tomorrow. I'm really glad that I knocked on her door to see if she'd seen the council about the field and I've got to find out how I'd made her feel and that I um, could start to put that right you know and if I if the field was just as it was I would never have known how I'd got to make her feel and I kind of just hope that don't worry it's going to be okay it might take a week or two but because I'm in talks with the council about about the field but yeah, I don't know. That was it. That was just thoughts from the day. Has anything in your life ever not been okay? As in permanently not been okay? Is this a really long, hard thing, please? Or have you frozen? Have you frozen? <laughs> This is a long, hard thing, please. She's frozen. She's frozen. Oh. Yeah. I think the other thing, I, I don't know if Lisa can hear, but it's interesting because if Lisa could have made that same flippant comment to 10 people, they would have all experienced it differently. And like... I know that if someone had said to you, if you'd said, oh, I haven't been out to have a shower and someone had said, oh, is that what the smell is? You probably would have fallen about laughing. But that lady took it and was so offended. And you see that it's always going to be how we interpret something. Like we can't give a feeling to someone else. Like we can't make someone feel bad. We can't make someone feel good. It has to be through their interpretation because the same words can create a different feeling in 10 different people. And I think that's something like I didn't know before. If someone says something horrible to me, of course I feel bad. Whereas like I've seen well, people have said all kinds of things about me now. And I'm like, wow. Word, words, you know, we, we, we forget that words are noises. I, I, I exercise my right to use an, an awful lot of prof, 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 There was a lady, God bless her. She's not on the call tonight, but when we did a retreat recently, um, she was from America and she couldn't join us live. So we sent her all the recordings and she, she hated my language. I mean, half the time I don't even know I'm swearing. And I, I had to write this email back and I had to say, look, I do apologize for my language. You know, um, I've been a tree surgeon for a lot of years and I've worked with blokes and the language kind of just is terrible. 
I admit it, you know, you get in a tree surgeon's van and within 20 minutes you'll have heard swear words used like punctuation and it's just, it's just the way it's been. And I remember one time just realising words are simply noises. They're just noises. They're not things. They're not, words can't hurt people. They're just a noise. Each word is just another noise that we've ha had to learn. They're not, they're not kind of established anywhere other than within the psyche of humanity. And it has to be a specific sector of humanity, the, the sector of humanity that actually understands the language. So, I mean, a Chinese person can F and blind at me and I wouldn't have a bloody clue. I'd, I'd probably go that way. I don't know. Um, rain? I don't know what it's going to do tomorrow. And, you know, it, you see that they're just noises. And yet people take such offence to words and such offence to language. And, but ultimately, you know, this offence is taking place within their being due to a belief that they carry and hold about a noise. It's a noise. And I'm, it's like, I, I try my best when I'm working with kids not to swear and stuff like that, do you exercise a little bit of common sense, but it doesn't always work. But we get so uptight and so hold on to these noises. Noise, even the word noise is a noise. It's a noise. It's a noise we recognise and then we attribute a meaning to it. It's like when we did God, put God up on the, on the board one time at our community group when we did it in person. I think Mark and Colette, you were there. And um, we, we ask people to score the word God out of 10. So if I was to use the word God out of 10, give it a mark, give it a score. So 10 being really, yeah, absolutely down with God. That's an awesome word. Beautiful description. Or one, no, I hate that word. It puts me right off. In fact, if you mention it, I'll probably leave. There was ones twos five sevens threes mark you scored it 10 colette you scored it 10 i remember you two scoring it 10 and there was and by the time there were 16 people in the room in this time and by the time we got to the end there was every single number on that board and this girl who was there she went we all see the world differently she saw it by looking at those numbers on the board through looking at the way we respond to words she saw that even the word god that one three letter three symbol three shaped word we all have a different experience of it and it was in that moment she just had the biggest insight didn't she do you remember do you remember you too she just went so for yeah she just went it's true we all see the world differently oh my god i love this oh my god and she was just like she was blown away i'm not sure i think lisa you might have been there as well but she was just blown away and it came about through realizing we all hear words differently people can swear all they like to me it doesn't sometimes i look at them my mum's asked you to not use certain swear words yeah certain swear presence. words even when i'm describing people who hunt foxes um you've done really well i've done very well but then I have, i've heard her use yeah it. i've heard that my mum's language has got worse when yeah. you've been in the house for a while so. Corrupted. well i was like i used to blink every time we swore. like especially if we we're doing a community group or a webinar and you'd start swearing a lot i'd like be blinking and feeling so uncomfortable and i don't realize oh that's you that's your beliefs and like yeah. there's been other people that said oh because you're just so down to earth and you just sow yourself, that put me at ease. And I'm like, okay, I'm sat there thinking people are going to be offended. Mm -hmm. And other people have felt put at ease by the just being yourself bit. So you can see that it's always going to be a perspective. It's yeah. always, and it's like, it, it always comes back to our mind, our experience of another human being or a world event or anything is going to come back to our mind. And I think that's something, it's, it's one of the most, powerful beautiful things we get to recognize because we see that our minds can change and i think there's been so many things in my life that i thought i could never see differently or there's certain things that people could do which i think i could never forgive or never have understanding with i've suddenly got understanding and forgiveness for and i've seen that the, the nature and the power of our mind is one that can fall into a place of love with anyone and anything as is and it's not through effort or will. And you see that this has been described and pointed to throughout time. 
because the world that we experience is not out there. The world that we experience is in here, all of it. It's the only place we get to experience. And it's like, it can feel sometimes, like I know people say, oh, that's a terrifying thought. Like I hate to live in here. And I was chatting to someone the other day and I was saying, someone might spend a day in my head and be like, oh my God, like that's the worst experience ever. Someone else, it might be like light relief compared to what their experience of life is. But we only know our own reality. We only know our own mind. We haven't got anything to judge it against. And the more that we can see that that's where experience comes from. It's within. And within is a metaphor for something that can't be put into words. And people have tried. And, but luckily, there's something that resonates with us. Like I always remember um, one of the American facilitators on our retreats would say that um, if you go into a guitar store and he was unfortunate because he didn't realise in the UK that a g-string is something else so then like the whole room is on the floor laughing and he's like he didn't know, he didn't understand he's like if you pluck the g-string on a guitar all the other g-strings in that room vibrate <laughs> everyone is falling about laughing and at the end you're like in the UK a g-string is like a thong like a and he's like I get yeah, it don't pluck them but so we could say the D string, but if you, you can see that there's something in this conversation that starts to resonate with people because it's in that place in which we are the same. That's the, vi the, 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 the vibration or the resonance that starts to happen for us. <laughs> like you don't know what's going through my head right now. No, we don't. One of my other favorite ones was a man called Dickon. We were, he was, you were doing a retreat with him and he, he stood up and he went, Again, American fella. I love morning glory. <laughs> I love morning glory. And we were all like... <laughs> no, everyone knew what he was talking about, but they just decided <laughs> you to... can't say that, mate. You can't. And he, he started going off about morning glory. And he, had, he was amazed. I'm amazed by the way it grows. And it, you know, it reaches and do you know what i've looked to see if it has an eye <laughs> God, he God, he said this i've looked to see if it's if it's got an eye and by this point everybody's falling about laughing and this poor fella's like what's going wrong what's going on here and at the at lunch at the brew time i said dickon your, your morning story mate your morning glory story he's like yeah dave what what was all that about i said I hate morning glory. He said, you hate morning glory? I said, I hate morning glory, Dick. And, well, how can you hate morning glory? It's so because beautiful. He, it's so beautiful, yeah. I like, because morning glory means something very different in the UK. He's like, what's that, Dave? I said, you know that involuntary erection you get first thing in the morning, Dick? And, That's morning glory in the UK. He's like, oh my God, in the, U in the US, it's a flower. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no, we call it convolvulus, mate. <laughs> It was beautiful. Oh, Bless and he was like, he just said, I really have to do my research into, into language. Do you know what I was like, yeah, you do. But I think one of the nice things about this is there's this, there's this sentence that I heard Sidney Banks say in one of his talks somewhere. He said, when you start to look within and you start to find this within yourself, when you start to wake up to the nature of life, when you start to gain insight, when you start to gain insight into life, you said, you will become a normal human being. He said, but in a world full of people trying to be super, you showing up as normal will shine. you will stand out because you're comfortable in your own skin. You will stand out because you don't need to stand in your soapbox. He said, you don't understand the nature, the, the power of somebody who is just genuinely just capable of being themselves. And I think that is a really beautiful thing to know that 
everybody in a world full of people trying to become superhuman and just to become soup just to become human is super that's the only thing anybody is truly looking for is acceptance love peace of mind that all lies in within our being when we're not trying to be somebody else trying to be something else trying to show up in the world as something else when we're just ourselves I just wanted to say that when it came to mind. Do we have any more questions? Please don't give us two stars or one star on Facebook for tonight's conversation. <laughs> I do apologise. Apologise about the morning glory story. I just wanted to share it. It was brilliant. <laughs> that was actually quite mild compared to some of your stories. It was, I suppose, yeah. yeah. The thing is, we, we often say some of the jokes your mum make, I'm like, you and your mum are like two peas in a pod. Yeah. You can see what, and then you see my family, and we're kind of a bit more, or my mum more so is like a bit kind of. My whole family are teachers, so they've had to learn to be appropriate around children, and I think it kind of spread into home life. And I've been taught how to be appropriate, and then you come in and you have different levels of what's appropriate and what's not. But again, beautiful example of it's all belief, it's all made up like some of the there's, there's been times when you've actually been upset at mine or cross about something and you've like almost had Tourette's and I'm just sat there like <laughs> you can have Tourette's you can say any word you want but can you just do it quietly because my family's downstairs and I don't want them to hear it <laughs> and I remember then saying it to my mum the next day and she's like oh it's I could just see he was upset it doesn't matter but I've been sat there like oh my god can you just not use that language <laughs> and I see I was really my upset. discomfort my discomfort and it looked like it was you and it's like it's but we're still we're human and i think it's but it's like lisa says here it's like no nothing is permanent it's like have we ever faced a situation which was terrible and was it permanent no we can learn from that point we go into things thinking that, that it's, it's going to be a permanent state of being no nothing is in a permanent state of being look at us all we've all changed we're no longer little embryos you know we're all later on in life and we will continue to change and evolve and that's the nature of life like my little patch of bare ground down there it's going to evolve it's going to change it's going to get different plants on it it's going to look different in another six weeks time and two years time ten years time no nothing is permanent nothing is permanent and that is the true nature of form anything that is born it dies anything that comes into existence goes out of existence but the coming into existence is as, is as essential a part as the going out of the existences and the going out of the existence is just as essential a part of coming in from to existence we come from the light we go to the light we are the light it's that it's like there is no experience we fear experiences because we think they're going to overcome and last forever nothing does not even the sun not even this galaxy there's a beautiful article that um as again linda pett the lady i was saying work with the kid with the school shooting um she's got a beautiful blog that she does i think it's under um the doctors pettit.com or something they have a website um because her and her husband both share this. Uh, Bill's a psychiatrist. I think he's one of the first psychiatrists to share. But she wrote an article about um, she was brought up Catholic and had very strong beliefs, and she still finds and, and can see a lot of beauty in in things that she learned. But she always remembers this time she'd walked along um, with Sydney Banks on Salt Spring Island and seen this poster, and it was about um, religion. And she said they'd, they'd stopped and looked at it for a while. And Sid had been aware that her, her wedding had been very Catholic and she um, had many um, different things in her home that were um, sort of Catholic um, representations and things. And he had such respect for people's beliefs that he, she said he just turned to her and he sort of smiled and he said, all forms will die, dear. And he knew that everything in this world of form at some point will go out of form, e even religion, because even that changes. And he knew that any form that's created at some point will be uncreated. 
and he knew his message like as soon as there was too much form around it or people would have like all these books or curriculum around it he'd often be like nah that's not it because he knew that as soon as we put this form around anything it's it's not it anymore mm. we've got we've got lost it we can use it form in beautiful ways to point and to guide but it's he if as soon as he saw people getting attached to the form that, that they'd been created he'd be like no that's not it take that book out of print get that tape away like it's not it and i think as soon as we see that anything that takes form has its life and then dies it's the same with a thought it's the same with our mind it it's the only thing that doesn't change is the impermanence and i think the, the more that we recognize that i feel like we do get to weather things that we think feels permanent but i kind of know it isn't even like the worst feelings it's like we get more acceptance around it because we know it's by its nature it can't stay forever but we also recognize that there isn't anything in that that can be created that we can't handle because we're not what's created we're what is experienced creation and i think when we make that distinction it's like we weather more storms without feeling so battered by them mm. And you identify less with the experience and more with the experiencer. Any more questions? Or comments or Musty's really hurt his legs, he's limping. Bless him. He's saying he's hard as nails though, because he's still Dave's sister lives right at the bottom of a long downhill drive in a static caravan. So every morning he cut, he barks to wake us up. We come upstairs, we feed him his breakfast. Give him his cup of coffee. Yeah, he has his breakfast. And then we'll hear him go out the front door, run down, bark at Lisa's caravan and wait for his treats. So even though he can hardly move his back leg, he still goes down every morning. He hasn't to get mentioned his... it once. He doesn't moan about it. He just gets on with it. Yeah. Any more questions? Or any comments or any observations? Colin, I hope I we haven't put you off our cult. Um, and if like I feel, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I forgot. I think yeah, I've forgotten your your, your wife's Catherine. name, Catherine. Catherine, that's right. Yeah, Catherine. I'm sorry if we've. I hope we haven't offended, and I hope we haven't put you off our cult. But it's so nice for you both to have joined us tonight. I know you've been watching us online, so you probably knew what to expect. Probably used to it already. Um, but thank you so much for coming to join us. And thank you everybody for coming to join us. And I'll put a link on the Facebook group to um, some of the things we've mentioned, like the blog and different things we've talked about in the co-op. Morning a link on glory there. and stuff like that. I'll try and find the talk with Dick and does it because I think you can hear everyone snickering. <laughs> it's it was, terrible. We were filming it and I was like, this is going to be terrible for the film. <laughs> <It was> terrible. <laughs> well, thank you everybody. Thanks everybody for being part of this and joining us. Um, and I think I I had put down that we were doing next week, but it's not. We're going to miss next week, and it'll be the week after. So I think it's the second of July. I think it's Thursday, the second of July. Um, because we're we've booked to go to a premiere, but it's now on Zoom. I think for some film. Oh yeah. Which is now it's 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 next Thursday. So next group will be July the second. Thank you, everyone. Love to everybody. Mwah. Keep safe and uh, good luck with your nags. Don't stop telling people they smell. <laughs>